Um, our speaker tonight is Doug Gann. He's a preservation archaeologist from Tucson, Arizona. Um, he'll be speaking for about 45 minutes on uh, the digital humanities and archaeology. Hi, I'm Doug Gann. I'll be your speaker tonight. And um, I, th I guess I, the first thing that I should do is take a short step back and explain what I, what's meant by the phrase digital humanities. Um, it's, it's a kind of catch-all phrase that became popular about 10 years ago um, to describe the folks who are working in technology, but also in traditional humanities fields. So it feels like history, archaeology, art history, art um, conservation. Uh, these fields have all become amenable to, um, if not digital uh, methods, at least digital analyses. And a really good example of a great d d uh, digital humanities project, um, one historian recently stated that his, his studies of 18th century English uh, literature if he were to follow every article published in eight, about 18th century English literature, he would be reading for 4,000 years. The uh, amount of scholarship that's going on right now is so overwhelming, people are resorting or, in, uh, or turning to digital tools to at attack this sort of data in a way that renders it meaningful to them. So um, for instance, our, our historian would run a semantic analysis on all 4,000 of these articles and he would look for broad scale patterns in the digital analysis. In my case, um, I don't know how to explain this without just kind of going back and describing my history and all of this. I sort of fell into the digital humanities almost by accident um, as I started to study archeology. span um, Getting back to, to high school, I was uh, a geeky kid. Um, I had an Apple II computer and computers made more sense to me than people did. So I, I quickly started learning how to interact with computers on a bunch of different levels. And at the same time, I was hired as an office boy for a company called Cooper Aerial Survey, where I got introduced to the subject of what's called photogrammetry. And how many of you know what photogrammetry is? A good number. If you've seen a topo, a USGS topo map, you're looking at the results of photogrammetry. All of those topo lines were drawn in the 1960s by this amazing type of stereo plotter where you took two photographs of the same area that overlapped, you inserted the photographs into these optical slots, and then you had like a submarine periscope with a cursor that would allow you to trace contours in 3D. And the contour lines would go out on this metal arm and there would be a pin at the end of that arm and that they would draft on a sheet of vellum that was essentially four by eight feet. That vellum got overlaid on top of the aerial photographs, and that's how topo maps get made. Um, and so I, I was very fascinated by it, but not fascinated enough to go on with aerial survey. So I was kind of at a, a strange point in my life. I had enrolled at the U of A, and I was majoring in MIS, which is Management Information Systems, um, computing for business, and I flunked my, my major. I flunked Introduction to COBOL Programming. <laughs> To my credit, the COBOL programming system, it takes almost 500 cards to add two plus two. And the, the wait for the card punch machine was, was two hours. The wait to get your, your stack of cards processed was 45 minutes. And then you had to wait for an hour for your process output to be put in a paper slot with your name on it. And I just couldn't manage it. And so I took a year off and was just sort of depressed and trying to say what, my, what I wanted to do. And my mom said, well, you, you loved that archaeology class. You got an A in that. Why don't you go on a dig? And so I did. I went, uh, to the, I went to the Saratoga battlefield in upstate New York, completely different than the Southwest. And I absolutely fell in love with archaeology. Um, I didn't find a thing with my first dig. But the methodology, the reliance on the XYZ grid, um, the, the types of inferences that were just being made about the soil patternings, I was hooked. And um, I left that excavation feeling really excited and I took a train down to DC and I encountered the equation that would change my life. And this is it. Uh, does anybody recognize this? Just have... This is the Drake equation. This is an equation made by Frank Drake in the 1960s it's a thought experiment. It's a calculation of how many extraterrestrial civilizations should there be. N is the number of extraterrestrial civilizations, times R, which is the rate of star formation, the 
times the fraction of these stars that are going to have planets, times the fraction of these stars that are in, in the habitable zone, times the fraction of those star or planets that evolve life, times the fraction of, of the life that evolves into intelligence, times the fraction of intelligent life that wants to communicate, times the, times the average expected lifespan of a technological civilization. And so when you fill in all of these variables, you get a calculation for what you think should be the right number of alien civilizations. Well, what changed my life was a, was a touchscreen exhibit at the Smithsonian. And they sat you down to solve this equation. And for each variable, you had three scholars. Sometimes they were, they were the, you know, the, the scholars you would expect for like an astrophysicist is going to tell you what the probability of life evolving on a planet is. An artist might have a better insight on whether or not your technological civilization is even going to want to communicate. But for each one of these variables, they gave you three choices, three different viewpoints. And then at the end of the exhibit, it, it ran your numbers and said, okay, according to you, there should be three extraterrestrial civilizations. I was captivated by this. I was just captivated by the, an exhibit that could share multiple viewpoints, that fostered critical thinking in the people that were using the exhibit, and it took their input and took their opinions and served them information that was relevant to them. Then I knew what I wanted to do. I, wanted, I knew for certain that I wanted to be an archaeologist and I wanted to work in, in digital interpretive media. And so um, I came back to Tucson, I hit the ground running, and I didn't look back. Um, the, next pl the next place in this story is the site of Amalabi 4 um, up in Winslow, Arizona. And I was, a, I was a senior at the time, and well, I was a senior for three years. Uh, <laughs> there were just so many great excavations to go on. Um, but my job was to go across this site and just map room corners. And so there was, this room was on a hill, there was a bedrock cap, there were all these boulders with amazing rock art on them. And 25 rooms across the top, maybe 150 cascading down the sides. And as I was brushing the debris away and, and trying to find the room corners, I kept wanting to see this. I, I'm, I'm a visually oriented person. I can't draw with beans. I wanted to see, I thought, this must look like, like that stacked pyramid. And I thought, well, you know, there, there's scanners and Adobe Photoshop just came out. And maybe if I scan pictures of wall segments from, from Hopi, I could use those wall segments to try, and, um, to try and stitch together a model of what this place might have looked like. Well, it wasn't that easy. Perspectives are hard, and, and it, I, after, trying, after getting decent walls for a couple of rooms and taking a couple of weeks, I, I gave up. But the mapping technology behind all of this really, set, really made sense to me. Everything is mapped on a northern, e northern easting, and elevation axis which goes back to the same XYZ coordinates that I was used to in, in three-dimensional computer programming. So it was something that I really liked and I really enjoyed. And um, a friend on the project told me that, hey, there's this program called AutoCAD that's come out and it lets you draft in three dimensions. And so um, I was fortunate enough to have my advisor uh, cobble together funds with a couple other folks um, and they bought a copy of AutoCAD, and I started making 3D, very, very rudimentary, very simple 3D models of ancient places. And um, it was a kick. It was really a lot of fun. And I, I, I started getting more and more involved and interested in 3D modeling of um, artifacts, objects, um, even landscapes. So as I was approaching my uh, dissertation, um, the Rio Nuevo project in Tucson started, and the centerpiece of Rio Nuevo were two, uh, two historic structures. One was the Mission San Agustin, and the other was the Tucson Presidio. And on the Tucson Presidio, um, this very crude sketch here, here's Washington Street and Church Street in Tucson. There was an excavation on the parking lot that, we, that Howry had determined was on top of one of the Presidio walls. So it was the first excavation I'd ever heard of where our sampling strategy was governed by parking spaces. And we were told, you can excavate 12 parking spaces. So out of the 12 parking spaces, they found the Presidio wall, and they found this torreon, or torreon which is basically a, a sort of a, out, a building on the side of the castle where you can shoot at people who are hiding along the bases of the walls. This project was scheduled for um, reconstruction. So I found a really neat niche in using 3D modeling in, in the planning of public projects for this. 
So um, there were a lot of different stakeholders. They all had different views as to how this, how the Presidio should look, where it should be located, what, what the visual profiles were going to be, what it was going to do to the neighborhood. And what I was able to do was to take these 3D models into these meetings and show them what, what the planners were thinking. And then the neighborhood group would come back and say, well, could you move this a little over this way so that this view blind doesn't get blocked? And the Presidio Trust said, well, can you include these features so that we can do living history presentations? And so I'd come back to the next meeting a month later with all of this viewpoints built into the, the actual model. And very quickly, it, instead of you know, neighborhoods of being uh, NIMBY and at loggerheads, everybody has agreed. They saw that their viewpoints were being taken and incorporated into the project. And that was a really rewarding pro process and project because it it, it's very rare that you see anything you build in, in virtual, virtual space actually become physical. Um, but it was, it was a real kick. The other project was for the Mission San Agustin, which was much more controversial. Um, the chapel fell in 1854, but this building, which is called the Convento, it's not a convent, it's a cross between an office building and a dormitory that supported the church. That building stood until about 1900, and there were 40 or 50 amazing historic photographs of this Convento. And so what I did was I did some research and started using something called close range non-stereo pair photogrammetry, which means I was taking sets of photographs that were, that were all of the same subject and extracting three-dimensional information out of it. It didn't follow the, the standard models of photogrammetry, which rely on very precise math, but it was close enough that I could get a, a fairly accurate model of the Convento building built from these photos. And uh, we got right up to uh, the point where we had a groundbreaking, they were gonna get started on rebuilding this mission and it all fell apart. The city pulled the plug, it all stopped. And um, I have to admit, I'm glad that they did. Um, the reconstruction on the Presidio, if you're ever down in Tucson downtown, they did an amazing job of, of building an adobe, a big adobe wall that looks like a big adobe wall from that time period. Um, if, if the folks who were, were gonna rebuild the Convento had rebuilt the Convento, it would have been laser sharp cut. Um, there are some other examples of, of smaller projects they did in this style. It would have been a very weird, very strange looking building. And so um, that got me through my dissertation. And then um, more and more research started happening on photogrammetry. It's really obvious that three dimensional information is contained in photographs. It's rendered as 2D or two in two dimensions as a flat image. But when you have overlapping sets of photographs, you can extract three-dimensional information out of them. And so um, what, what happened was um, an unemployed Russian physicist uh, invented this program called PhotoScan. And PhotoScan takes big blocks of, of related photographs and analyzes them. And it's one of these programs where you say go, and then you come back two days later to see the results. And um, the results generally tend to be pretty amazing. And so I got more and more excited about using this particular program and this type of software. And we had an opportunity with, through the National Science Foundation to do a project called Chaco's Legacy. And in Chaco's Legacy, um, we hired uh, Adriel Heise to fly over Chaco Canyon and map the entire five by seven mile park uh, shooting straight down and at oblique angles. Um, I plugged all of those photos into PhotoScan and it spit out a pretty decent model of Chaco Canyon. So if you ever um, want to take a look at this exhibit, it's on the Archaeology Southwest website. Just look, search for Chaco's legacy. Um, and, but I bit off more than I ch could chew with Chaco's legacy. I, the, the area was too large. There wasn't enough fine detail in the, in the large scale plots of the models. And so we tried again um, with Pecos Pueblo. Again, we, um, we hired Adriel Heise. And Adriel has this amazing aircraft. It's, um, it has a stall speed of about 45 miles an hour, which means it can slow down to 45 miles an hour and start taking pictures. The gusts of wind that Adriel were, was flying in was between 30 and 45 miles an hour. So there were periods of time where his plane just stopped in midair and just, just hung there. I've never seen an aircraft hover before. 
and the, a wing would dip and I'd nearly have a heart attack and then he'd pull out and, and continue his flight line. Um, we went in first and set 12 uh, aerial targets with um, GPS, survey grade GPS, and we knew the locations of those 12 targets. And Adriel shot about 1,000 images for all 290 acres of Pecos. And um, the resulting model was so accurate, we could see our own footprints from where we had left our targets. We could see all of Cushing, of Cushing, um, Kidder's, all of Kidder's original trenching at Pecos was absolutely visible in the model. Um, and when Mike Brock, our, our digital cartographer, ran the numbers, we mapped 290 acres where every feature was accurate to 14 millimeters. And that's an aerial, that's a, the pilot, that was about $3,000. Mike's time, my time. Grand total of about $8,000, $9,000 was spent. And if you tried to map 290 acres to 14 millimeters, with regular technology, you would be looking at half a million dollars easy. There's just no way you could. So that, that's how transformative this particular type of technology is. It's really, really changing things. Um, and so um, over the past couple of weeks, or a couple of weeks, over the past two months, there's been something really amazing in Tucson. And that is the, the, this, the ex exposure of an early agricultural period farm surface. And this is a, this is a preserved surface. It's like a, a moment captured in time. It's about 20 by 40 meters, and it shows two early agricultural period farming cells bounded by three irrigation canals. The berms are, um, the berms that sort of uh, line the waffle gardens are visible. The planting holes are visible and the footprints of moms, dads, dogs, um, kids um, are all over the surface. It's a recording in time of, of just this one moment where it must have been a wet day on the farm and we can see people going from, from canal gate to canal gate, pushing the mud around to direct water into their farms. And we knew that this behavior had gone on uh, from excavations at Las Capas but the exposures at Las Capas were really clean and flat, and they just sort of cut through the edges of the berms. So we didn't have a surface that people were actually living on. And um, it was a, just a remarkable, I, I've never seen anything like it in 30 years of doing archeology. span um, But when these were first found, it was, it was it realized that, well, we can't preserve these. Um, uh, the road is going through, um, the bridge is going through, the, this, footprint deposit is gone. It's gonna be bulldozed in about three weeks. So we need a way to record this quickly. And um, Dan Arnett, the backhoe operator who found the footprints from, from his backhoe, um, called my colleague, um, I'm, I'm terrible with names of the spot. Um, he called me and we ran over and I started doing the 3D fo photogrammetry right there on the spot. Um, just as they, as they would do a new exposure, I'd come back out and shoot it again. And the way that I would collect these photographs was I have a, a 25 foot pole. Um, it's an extendable uh, carbon pole that's normally used uh, for working on power lines. And um, I changed the end of it and I took a, a simple Canon point and shoot camera, attached it to the end of the pole ran a camera hack program that made the camera take a picture every four seconds, hoisted the camera up, held it at a 45 degree angle, and I would just walk transects back and forth up and down the site. So um, for each exposure, I would try to get between 800 and 1,000 photographs, and then come back, feed them into the, the photogrammetry software, and away they would go. Now the photogrammetry software has gotten more complex and, and <laughs> So at the same time, more complex and easier to use. It's really, it, it depends upon how much detail you want to get out of, the, out of your model, how much time the model's going to take. So I ran a quick model. Um, I, I mapped this surface last Monday, and I ran a quick model in my car um, as I was driving to California. <laughs> and um, of course, the, the computer ran out of battery power about halfway through. Uh, my, my adapter wasn't very good. But um, I was able, you know, from a hotel room, I was able to get a quick and dirty model out. And that only took about, uh, you know, overnight rendering. But to get it, and that model had um, essentially 100,000 XYZ 
100,000 XYZ points that defined the, that ancient surface. Um, if I were to turn up the quality settings to the maximum, um, it would take two weeks of processing and the resulting model will have 100 million XYZ points, all accurate to within a millimeter. Um, so that's how much all of this stuff has changed. And um, the, there's new software coming out, the processes are getting better and better. And so I think we're going to just have to start incorporating this type of 3D modeling into our actual archeological practice. Um, it, it, you know, all you need to do is shoot 16 photographs of a, a trench you're about to dig, and then you've got the 3D model of the top surface of the trench. You dig your first level, you shoot another 3D model. You dig your next level, you shoot another 3D model. The amount of information and detail that's being recorded by these models is, is too valuable to just, to just trust um, to you know, the excavator's memory and the, and the field notes. I think we can really start using this technique to do some pretty amazing things. So I mentioned that um, I was driving to California. Um, I was driving to the California for the first conference on um, virtual reality and um, basically the first, the first official conference on head-mounted virtual reality. Can I have a, see a show of hands? How many of you have been, in been inside a virtual reality? One? Um, how many of you have used Google Earth? Okay, all of you have used Google Earth. That's a virtual reality. That's a, that is a mathematical rep representation of a space, in this case, the entire Earth, in which three-dimensional data is being served to you visually. So, I mean, that's, that's the most simple virtual reality that, that all of us can ac access for free right now. But uh, what we saw at this conference um, kind of blew us all away. I'd been working on this all along. Um, so what I'd like to do is share some virtual reality models with you all. And um, Bill really th threw down the gauntlet on this because all of my work is so visual. It's, it's purely visually oriented. And Bill put down his foot, said no PowerPoint. So, um, so uh, Elvis Costello said that uh, writing about music was like dancing about architecture. So talking about virtual reality is, is like dancing about architecture, uh, wearing, uh, wearing uh, dark, dark, dark glasses, I guess would be the best way to put it. But I'd like to share some of these models with you all. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a one person at a time process. So um, what I'd like to do is get some volunteers and just if you all can watch the reactions, um, I, think, I think it'll be rather interesting. I'd like to start with a volunteer. I'll warn you, this is being recorded. You will be wearing my phone on your face and it's gonna look a little silly. Um, but if I could have a volunteer. Um, come on up. Okay. So the phone goes in the viewer like this. This is called Google Cardboard. You can buy a cardboard version of this for um, $5 on Amazon, I paid $20 for the, the high-tech plastic version because my cardboard one wore out. Okay, do you want to put this over your head? <laughs> what do you see? Okay, uh, well, it's like a vault. Uh, um, Pit like uh, in a oh this is a kiva yeah okay oh this is uh, uh, I think this is um, uh, Aztec uh, correct kiva and Aztec yep great kiva at Aztec you all been there right yeah so do you feel like you like you're sort of there holy smokes it's yeah yeah. <laughs> No, unfortunately you can't. But that's, this is a type of virtual reality called a photo bubble. So what you do to, to make a photo bubble is you take your phone into a place like the Great Kiva at Aztec, and you, the phone coaches you, okay, move the, your camera here, take a picture. Move your camera here, take a picture. Move your camera here, take a picture. And when you shoot all of your angles, it puts all of the photos together into this bubble that you stand inside of that puts you back inside um, Aztec in this case. 
um, the great Kiva at Aztec. I, everywhere I go in the Southwest now, I collect these photo bubbles to, to be able to share places like this. Does it feel like you're there? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's like feeling it. Like well, it's better than the 3D movie because it's like you're inside of it. Wow. Exactly. It's 360. Yeah. You can look up, you can yeah. look down. You can look down. You should see my, uh, my feet there yeah. in converse. <laughs> Cool. Okay. <laughs> hey. Thanks. All right. Um, if uh, I could get another volunteer, I'm going to change things a little bit here. Okay. This is going to be completely different, so don't expect uh, don't expect much. How about my glasses? Um, off? Try it first with the glasses off and see if that works. And if not. Um, Okay, just go ahead and put this over your head. Oh, that doesn't work. <laughs> Oopsie. Okay, did I do that? No, nope, I did that. Okay, put this over your head. So, what do you see? Pots. Pots. Suspended. In space. In space. <gasps> And time. Time. It's a time structure, sort of. Yeah, exactly. So if you look closely, you'll see some blue spheres. Blue spheres, spheres. If you focus your gaze on a blue sphere for two seconds, um, you'll, tr you'll teleport to that spot. OK, I haven't found a blue sphere. Look, look way up. Yep. And? Oh. You've moved. So now you're midway up. What she's looking at is a distribution of southwestern ceramics in time and space over a map of the southwest. So right now she's in, in sort of the, the southern deserts of Arizona. She's gone up through the very simple seed jars that, that first started as ceramics. And she's worked her way up into the red on buff tradition. And if you keep going up the, uh, she, I'm making j hand gestures as if she can see. <laughs> I'm pointing up. If, you, if she keeps working up on the sequence, she can go all the way through the Hohokam sequence from, from the, the, the very beginnings of ceramics to the modern, the modern fine art of the Oodam. And it, this, this sequence allows you, you can take different pathways through it. You can examine how the Anasazi, or I'm sorry, the ancestral Puebloan potteries evolve through time, and in each case you wind up in the modern period where all of these different tribal groups have, have be, either the work is either, the work is either thought modern fine art by about 1400, or it's modern fine art by about 1800. Wow. Yes? Can you convert this into some kind of a DVD or a video? Yes. That other people can see? Yes, I can put this on a website, I can put this on an Xbox, PlayStation, um, Mac, PC, iPhone, tablet. The, the beauty of the system that we've developed to, to create these exhibits, you write the exhibit once and you can export it in an unlimited number of formats, essentially. Well, I am definitely going to be taking this uh, model and putting it on the uh, Apple Play Store and, I'm sorry, the Apple App Store and the uh, Google Play Store, so that if you buy your, if you buy your the cardboard, this the ceramic experience will be uh, downloadable for free. Yeah. I, I know some 3D require regular. Right. 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 No, not at all. And I only have one eye that matters, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, the system will still work for you, and you'll still see. You'll still see. It'll be a 2D projection rather than a 3D projection, but it'll still work. Yes. This is the same outgrowth as the one that you were showing at, at the Arizona State Museum about six or seven years ago. It cost you like ten million dollars. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You mean the cave? Yeah. The before head-mounted virtual reality, there were these there were these things called caves, and you, you they were rooms with projectors behind the walls on all sides. And you wore these glasses, and you walked into the space, and it was sort of like a holodeck. Um, that that cave is actually at the end of its use life. The the, the ma maker won't support it anymore. 
um, and everything's going to, to head mounted. But you can't reach out of these and turn the pots around. Yes, you can. Like you can't in this one, but oh. yes, um, we're working on that. And really? Yeah. The thing is, it's, it's how do you get people to be able to control the device without using their hands? And so like on a normal touchscreen exhibit, you would touch a button and that would cause an action. Well, she, you can't touch the phone because it's inside the box. And so um, what I'm working on are gaze-based switches. So if you want to change something in the model, you just stare at it for a couple of seconds and that causes the change. Wow. How does it know that? It knows it because it, it keeps track of exactly where your head's pointing at all times. Uh huh. And then they disappear. Yeah, yep. Once you look at it. When you get to a point where you can go to Best Buy and find some kind of gadget that will uh, make this easy for you to see, or yeah. do you have to have a phone? Well, uh, that's a great question. Um, there are, there's a number of viewers coming out that don't need phones, but they're pretty expensive, um, unfortunately. They're, I, the cheapest ones, I think, starts around $700. Okay, let's do one more. Can I get one more volunteer? Oh, thank you. That was You're welcome. Wonderful. Okay, so in this simulation, you are standing on the surface that the ancients walked on 3,000 years ago. Okay. In, on the surface, you'll see divots, which are corn planting holes. You'll see sort of oblong dark spots, which are the actual footprints. Okay. And you'll see red and white targets. If you keep your gaze focused on a red or white target for two seconds, you'll move to that target. So go ahead and give it a try. And I'm looking at it, but it's not. I see the backhoe. You see a backhoe? Let me try moving you to a, a do, you, do you, is it working for you at all? Do you see, do you see the point of the exhibit? It might be my, my uh, without my glasses, it may be that okay. it's not seeing very well. But I'm really only seeing with one eye. Okay, well, I'm gonna have this uh, b uh, back over here on the table for any of you that would like to try this out and not be on camera, I'll be happy to share, share a model or two. Um, so, this past week, um, I, I mentioned that I went to this conference, and it, it's the, the, the transformation that's going to happen in our society from these technologies is really going to be mind blowing. Um, I saw things I just couldn't, I simply couldn't believe people could do um, with computing today. And, and one of the really interesting things was, you know, right now we're all talking about virtual reality, which is the head mounted display that, that blocks you off from the rest of reality. These experiences I think would be really cool to be able to download at home and to experience at home, and, you know, experience in a space that you're comfortable with. But I don't see much use for these in museums right yet. Um, it's a one at a time experience. It can't really be shared. Um, and I don't know about you, but I don't really like being in public spaces and having my vision cut off all around me when I'm touring through a museum. So the technology that's on the horizon that's about to change all of this is called augmented reality. And um, how many of you remember the movie Minority Report with Tom Cruise and, and that, that hellish scene in the mall where he's walking through the mall and all of the advertising is popping up around him, selling stuff specifically directed at him? That's a type of augmented reality. And with augmented reality, you don't cut yourself off from the rest of the world you wear a visor that puts information on the rest of the world for you. So like for this footprint site, um, when we were doing site tours, if I had an, an augmented reality device like um, uh, Google HoloLens, we could have people wearing this and put water back in the canals, put corn plants back on the surface, have actors animating the, the process of ancient farming, and that would just be layered onto reality. Um, I have, I, yeah. I think that was the hope that they had for Google Glass. They did augmented reality. It didn't seem to have caught up. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, the point was Google Glass uh, was, was hoping for that and it didn't c catch on. It, um, it was expensive and it was threatening because, because people didn't understand the, the way the camera was working. Um, when, when, when augmented reality really works, I think it's going to be an amazing type of experience where, like at Aztec Ruins, um, you could wear a, 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 a visor like this, walk through the Pueblo and see all of the objects that are in the museum put back in situ. And this is not out of the realm of possibility. Um, there's a, a memorial project happening at the University of Arizona. Um, uh, an artist and an architect have decided to put plaques on the University of Ari Arizona Mall at one-to-one -one scale on the outline of the battleship Arizona. And it's going to be a memorial, and each of the plaques is going to have the name of one of the soldiers who perished on the ship. I'm going to be working on an augmented reality project to put the ship back on the mall so that you, we, you have to focus on a, t on a target. You have to start by focusing on a target and that gets the system all oriented to where's north and where's south and, and where, what your location is. But then you look up and there's the battleship. And as you walk around the mall, your perspective changes accurately in, in, in real time. Um, and that's the sort of thing I'm really excited about working, working towards in the future. Um, at this conference, I met the person who did the, uh, did the movie with the, the mall scene with all of the augmented reality, throwing advertisements at, at everybody as they walked around, and he thought it was a good thing. He didn't, he didn't realize he had programmed it. You know, most people see this as a dystopia. You know, he's really looking forward to selling contracts to, to make uh, posters in malls identify you and try to sell you things that it knows you want. So it's, it's going to be, a, there's always good with the bad. But um, that's the sort of stuff that I'm working on, and go uh, cool, yeah. Isn't that the same kind of thing as the new fire trial in helmets, where they can look through their own aircraft and see what's around them? Yes, that's that's exactly the type of augmented reality. Except those helmets cost you know hundred thousand dollars a pop or a million dollars a pop. But it's the same idea. Yeah, to to be in your car and not see your car, that could be kind of interesting. But. Um, yeah, um, that's the sort of projects that I'm working on. That's my take on, um, on contributions to, to the digital humanities. And if you follow the uh, Archaeology Southwest website, um, we should have a new uh, update on the footprint site soon. And you'll be able to interact with these 3D models that, that show all of the footprints and the canals. And for me, the most amazing thing is, is just the way that they're moving mud um, on a specific gradient um, to get water into their fields. You'll be able to see the evidence for all of this for yourself. And uh, I think that's, the, that's kind of the neatest thing of all. And I should take a step back. For, from my perspective, the other thing that's just absolutely amazing is that the tools that I use to create 3D models, um, when, I, when I'm building 3D models, I have two computer monitors, my 3D editors in one window, Photoshop's in another window, and I'm working with these 2D planes to create three-dimensional information, all of my authoring tools are being imported into the, into the virtual reality. So instead of working at a desk and, and looking through these glass monitors, I can be standing in my office working on geometries, changing textures, changing the look and feel and lighting of scenes live while I'm inside the model. And for me, that's the most exciting thing of all because the, the productivity boost that we're going to get out of that to, to be able to see your work as it really looks in, in the virtual world is going to make it look so much better to everyone else, which will make our job of sharing archaeology with the public that much easier. And uh, yes? How close are you to that? How close? Uh, three weeks? Well, I think three weeks. Is it up on the website for Southwest? Yes. The, the question is, is this, is this something that can be used as, as video clips in museums? Yes, it already is. It, this is an evolution out of that whole, whole technology. And what I create for this can very easily be rendered out as a, as a video or motion picture. Or One of the things I'd like to do, um, both in Tucson and Phoenix, is render an animation um, and put it on a big screen TV in the streetcars. 
So as the streetcar goes down um, Central, you could be looking back into um, the Hohokam era at 1350, and you, know, you could be seeing the canals that you're crossing, and seeing the major village sites that, you're, that your train is, is, is crossing as you go through, you know, as you go through real space looking back in sort of uh, simulated time. Um, that's a couple of years away, but that's, that's my, that's my near-term goal, is to, is to be able to create experiences like that. Yeah? Was it, what you're talking about, is it similar to, did you see the movie Avatar? Avatar? Where they're looking at this scene where the topography of yeah. the yeah. like all 3D, and they're swiping away these yes. pictures? Yeah, um, I, should, I should probably share this experience we had at the, at the conference. Um, they put us in this thing called the, the Vive, and the Vive is from HTC. It's going to be, go on sale in a couple of months. And it's a head-mounted visor. Um, its only drawback is it has this th thick cluster of cables that trails you around. But with the Vive, um, you define an area in space that you can walk in, and then the models, the models that you look at scale to that space. So you can physically walk around inside the virtual model. And um, the first simulation was this uh, amazing painting program where you just took your, your controllers and waved paint around through three-dimensional space and it left a three-dimensional paint blob. And then you could walk around behind it, add some detail, walk to the side, stretch it out a little bit. You could just create these paintings in, in three-dimensional space. And when you got too close to the, your, your defined edge, this blue glowing grid shows up like the holodeck in Star Trek that warns you, okay, stop, you can't go any farther, you're about to run into something. And so you take a step back. The second simulation was a shipwreck where you were down underwater and there's this <laughs> aquarium beautiful fish are, are swimming all around you. You can wave them away and you, you wave your arms and, the, and then a, a manta ray flies overhead and then you hear a whale sound and you turn around and this 60 foot whale comes right up sliding in beside you and stops and just looks at you. And the graphic quality of that was every bit as good as Avatar. And I've never experienced anything like it. And uh, I'm, still, I'm still sort of speechless about the experience because it was that, that visually believable. And uh, it's just right around the corner. Um, we're going to be able to start so serving archaeological sites and experiences like that. And uh, I've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, what I would start with is um, just download the Google Cardboard app, and it's got um, it's got the uh, it's got about five or six virtual experiences uh, built into it, and um, you can uh, and then download the uh, the Google Camera. It's made for both Android and iPhone. The Google Camera will let you take the three dimensional photospheres, and excuse me, the Google Cardboard software will let you see the photospheres in 3D. They're both completely free. Um, Can you share those? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You just pass the files along. We go out and we go to the Grand Canyon and we take a picture of all around. We can then share that with our relatives back east. If they've got the, if they've got the hardware, absolutely, yeah. So Google Cardboard, what else? Um, Google Camera. Google Cardboard? Google Cardboard is one program, and Google, Google Camera is another program. Um, and the, the, the one thing you gotta watch out for in all of this stuff is simulator sickness. Um, when, I, when I was doing those demonstrations in the cave at the University of Arizona, I did site tours and the tour of the pottery cloud for a day straight. Man, I felt tired. Then I did it for another day straight, and I felt like every single neurotransmitter in my brain had been exhausted. Um, I couldn't, I could barely walk, I, 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 could, I, I felt my brain slip, just nearly slowing to a stop. And I went to bed that night and I woke up the next morning and the phone was ringing at eight and it was the computer lab calling me and said, hey, we've got some big wigs and we'd love to show off your models, can you come down and show them again? I just started throwing up. I, I, I could not go back into that room. I just, ooh, um, it, it, it was that overwhelming. And so what I learned, one of the things I learned at this conference is, 
to avoid simulator sickness, you don't want to let your user physically accelerate. You want to teleport from place to place. You don't want to have them move because it's that movement that causes the simulator sickness. And so that's, uh, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting programming hitch in terms of developing interactive experiences, but um, it's, a, it's, it's a rule to live by. Sometimes you need to change the client. Well, yeah. What will you have on the Archaeology Southwest website that we can watch? This stuff requires, what you're talking about now, requires a Google Cardboard and a Google, Google Camera. Right. What will you have on on the website, you can see you can see and interact with the the 3D models from the footprint site. You can watch the same experience that she watched in the Google Cardboard. You can you can see it without the cardboard. You can just see it as a web page. And those footprints are from where? Uh, the footprints are from the Sunset Mesa site in Tucson, which is at the intersection of Sunset Road and I-10. Wow. Yeah. And all of that, that's the beauty of, of this type of media is you write it once and you can use it in so many different, different ways. And you can also download the, the Google Cardboard app if you want to install it on your own phone for the Footprint site. It's available for download there too. What if you only have a flip phone? <laughs> I've heard that if you type 888-888, uh, you'll get eights in 3D. Oh well. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. I get recruited. I get recruitment letters, and I don't want to leave Archaeology Southwest. Maybe. Yeah, we'll see. I've, I've, I've got. I've been building a library of 3D objects, of, of artifacts, sites, and landscapes for almost 30 years. And I just need to take two years and just get all of this stuff updated and get it into the new formats so that we can share this stuff with the public. And if I, if I get my two-year break to do that, then I might start thinking about t teaching classes. One thing's for sure that it, in two years, the technology will be a lot more mature and the, the head-mounted headsets will all be on the market, and then it's going to be a much more likely thing to try and teach classes about it. Yeah? You taught yourself, right? Yes. So is there, is there material out there that might especially go to, to educate you in this area? Um, I I, again, I would go back to, to Google Earth and Google SketchUp. That, that works your way through the basics of 3D modeling, and you build your model in 3D SketchUp, and I'm sure they're going to have a way to export that model into a Google Cardboard. Uh, that would be the path I would take. Um, no money involved. All the software is free. Um, and there's just tremendous educational resources already out there. YouTube channels, libraries of 3D models. Um, I, for the kids watching on, <laughs> on the, the videotape, um, there's a lot of room to do some really amazing stuff right now. Um, and it's, it's just an incredible opportunity. Yes. Do you lecture with a PowerPoint on this? Uh, not yet. I, I have lectured on PowerPoints about the, the 3D modeling in general, but not about the, the virtual reality stuff yet. This is my first virtual reality lecture. So did I do OK without the PowerPoint? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And for the moment, I can't see where, other than the resolution on the maps. Yeah, I wouldn't worry. I wouldn't. Would be good for right, agreement. right. I would. I would stick to just regular, regular Google Earth and, and SketchUp. You'll learn the basics about making a wireframe, how to drape images over that wireframe, um, to make things look realistic in 3D. You could probably build a model of your house. Um, that's probably one of the other things I should, should quickly uh, mention. All of this stuff would be so much easier with drones. Um, to, to, to not have to have the camera on the pole, to, to not have to walk back and forth. The tricky thing with, with modeling sites on a, on a camera on a pole is you can't really have things change in the scene that you're mapping from time over time. 
So for that sunset site, that was about the biggest site that I could ma map and model before the solar angles changed to the point where the software couldn't recognize what was happening in the scenes. So um, it's, it's, uh, SketchUp is a great way to, to avoid that pitfall and um, you could easily model your house or, or Pueblo Grande or, or anything like that. Yeah? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I should I should mention another software package while I'm while I'm at it. Um, Autodesk One Two Three D is the is the brand, and so if you go look, Google Autodesk One Two Three D, um, they have something called One Two Three D Catch, which lets you make models out of photographs. So it teaches you how to take the photos. You could go out to a, say a rock art site. You've got a beautiful boulder with some some really interesting. Um, Carvings on it. It teaches you the patterning and what you want, you know, the way you want to take the photos, and then you bring that home. You upload your photos to one, two, three D catch, and it builds a three D model for you and sends it back to you, which you could then put in your Google Earth, geo reference it, and and there you go. It's it's free. It's. Is that what Robert Mark is doing with, with the faces? Robert Mark is using. I believe he's using um, PhotoScan. But boy, he's doing some amazing work. Go behind him, look at him. Back. Right, yeah. Um, for the footprints, we could go underneath and, and see the sort of the print of the foot, which was kind of a fun perspective. Um, but yeah, this, all of these tools are out there and they're free. And it's just, I don't, I'm not sure why they're free, but heck, take, a, take advantage of them. It's really a lot of fun. I, I modeled my uh, daughter's messy bedroom to make the point that she needed to, <laughs> <laughs> she needed to pick up after herself. Fat chance. Yep. Yeah. That just sounds exciting for the future. I am. I am very excited. It's. It's. It's a bunch of tools that have all come to maturity all in the past six months. You know, six months ago we we could have done some of this, but we couldn't have shared it like this at all. Um, and we've been really fortunate to work with some really gifted programmers. Um, Drew Castilla is our, is our VR programmer behind the scenes. This person is an absolute genius. If you're familiar with desert archaeology, he's Trish Castilla's son. So it's sort of an all in the family, uh, all in the family programming effort. Um, and then David Coons here in Phoenix uh, developed the first set of software that let us start sharing these 3D models for Chaco's legacy. And I owe both of these guys a, a huge debt. All right, well, thank you for coming. If you want to check out one of the virtual reality models, I'll be back in the corner for a little while, and uh, it was great to chat with you all. Thanks.